This video is brought to you by our Patreon backers. Help us grow and create more content by supporting us on Patreon. So it seems that after months of negotiations, the UK has finally reached an agreement with the EU negotiators. Theresa May presented the deal to her cabinet. The reaction was, well, let's say mixed. The proposed deal passed through cabinet, but not without casualties. Dominic Raab and Esther McVeigh resigned from their cabinet positions as a result of May's deal. Before we get into the contents of the deal, let's quickly cover what will happen to the deal now. It's been agreed to by EU and UK negotiators, which is the first step. Then it was agreed to by May's cabinet, the second step. Now it needs to be approved by the EU summit, which is set to take place on the 25th of November. Then it will need to pass through the UK's House of Commons, likely to happen in the beginning of December. We discuss if it will pass through the House in another one of our videos, and next week we're set to release a video on what will likely happen at the EU summit. So subscribe to make sure you're kept up to date when that video comes out. So what's actually in May's plan? What will it mean for the UK post-Brexit? The document dives into three key aspects of the deal. The financial settlement between the UK and the EU, the rights of UK citizens in the EU and EU citizens in the UK, and the way that they're going to prevent a hard border between the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. Despite the document being very lengthy, at 585 pages, only seven pages are spent discussing the future trading relationship between the EU and UK. The full negotiations of future trade are still yet to come, so the brevity of this section isn't exactly surprising. Let's start with an area which probably caused the most problems for the UK and EU negotiators, the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. I know we've talked about this in a lot of other videos, but let me just cover the background quickly. For more than 30 years there was conflict at the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland, with Unionists and Nationalists fighting for the future of their nations. Nationalists wanted to see Northern Ireland become independent from the UK, while Unionists were in favour of Northern Ireland remaining in the United Kingdom. This conflict continued until 1998 when both sides reached a compromise. The result of the compromise is the Good Friday Agreement. This deal meant that Northern Ireland remained part of the UK, however Northern Irish citizens were allowed to hold both British and Irish citizenship. On top of this, the deal permitted the Northern Irish to leave the UK and join Ireland in the future. This deal was designed to keep both sides happy, with the Nationalists being able to gain Irish citizenship and Unionists satisfied that Northern Ireland was remaining within the UK. The result of the Good Friday Agreement was that hard borders and crossing points became a thing of the past. The border became more open and people and goods were able to pass freely between nations, without checks or borders. Post-Brexit, that could be set to change. That's because back in January 2017, May declared that the UK would leave both the Single Market and Customs Union. No longer would the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland be fellow EU nations, sharing common rules and tariffs. Instead, the border between the two would be an outer EU border. So how does May propose resolving this issue? Well, the deal assumes a comprehensive free trade agreement will be signed between the EU and UK between March 29th, 2019, when the UK actually leaves the EU, and the end of the transition phase at the end of 2020. This means that the free trade agreement doesn't need to come into force until January 2021, as the transition phase is set to continue until December 31st, 2020. During the transition phase, the UK will continue to follow EU rules and customs regulations, meaning that while we're in the transition phase, the border can stay open, as the UK and EU will continue following the same rules. It's only at the end of the transition period, when the UK no longer has to follow EU rules, that the whole Northern Ireland border issue comes back. Therefore, the EU and UK are hoping to reach a trade agreement before March 2021, to ensure that the transition can end and that the hard border doesn't need to return. Now this might just sound like them kicking the problem down the road. After all, they've had two and a half years to reach a deal on leaving. What's to say that in the 21 months after the UK leaves the EU, they'll be able to reach a free trade agreement? Because of this exact issue, the EU insisted on having a backstop in place. If there were no backstop, Ireland would still be in the EU and Northern Ireland would leave, meaning that the hard border would likely return. For a long time, the EU suggested a backstop agreement, which left Northern Ireland in the EU's customs union, part of the single market, and within the EU's VAT system, until a final deal is reached. This would mean that until a free trade deal is reached between the UK and EU, Northern Ireland would remain close to the EU, and as such there wouldn't be any need for a hard border. However, May rejected this deal, as it's only Northern Ireland who's staying close to the EU, essentially shifting the border into the Irish Sea. The concern that many Brits have is this could potentially damage the overall union and could be a step towards Northern Ireland leaving the UK altogether. 
The UK's counteroffer was that the entirety of the UK would remain in the customs union instead of just Northern Ireland, a proposal which the EU rejected. Both sides ended up reaching a compromise in the proposed deal. The EU accepted that the entirety of the UK would remain in the EU's customs union until the end of the transition period, and the UK accepted that they weren't allowed to leave until the EU said so. Essentially, the backstop in May's deal means that the whole of the UK stays in the EU's customs union unless and until the EU agrees that the UK leaving won't result in a hard border. This essentially continues the transition period indefinitely, with the deal rather ominously noting that the Joint Committee could make a decision extending the transition period up to the 31st of December 20xx. That's not a typo, they simply mean that the transition period could be extended until the end of the century. While the UK is in this transition period, the agreement requires that the UK observe level playing field commitments, which means that they have to stay in alignment with the EU on competition and state aid, as well as employment and environmental standards, tax, and the rulings of the European Court of Justice. Okay, so you clicked on a video about Theresa May's deal, and all I've done so far is bang on about how hard it will be for May to pass a deal, backstops, and the history of the border. Surely there can't be so little in those 585 pages that I'm forced to pad this much. Pad so much, in fact, that I'm getting introspective about the fact that I'm padding. So let's run over some of the other key points. The UK has agreed in the proposed bill to pay the EU a £39 billion divorce settlement. I discussed the reasons behind a divorce settlement at length in another video, but essentially the payment comes in two parts. Payments towards the EU's budget and outstanding commitments. In 2014, the UK agreed to pay towards the EU's budget until the end of the current budgeting period in 2020. So some of the divorce settlement goes towards keeping this promise. The UK has also agreed to fund a large number of EU projects. The divorce payment means that the UK is continuing to pay what it promised initially, as long as the project in question is completed before 2030. This means that the UK could continue paying for projects taking place in the EU long after leaving. However, the reverse is also true, with EU nations forced to contribute what they promised to pay towards EU projects based in the UK. The rights of EU citizens in the UK and UK citizens in the EU seem to be fully protected by May's proposed deal, which isn't surprising considering the UK and EU have agreed on this for months. EU citizens will be allowed to move to the UK until the end of the transition currently set for 2020. They'll be allowed to live and work in the UK, and if they stay for five consecutive years, they'll be allowed to stay in the UK permanently. The same is true for UK citizens living in the EU. The UK is set to continue stockpiling medicines. Without a trade deal in place, the UK can't rely on the fact that they'll be able to continue importing medicines from the EU post-Brexit. So as a precautionary measure, the UK will probably continue stockpiling drugs. The NHS also will be hit by the loss of EU staff. While EU staff in the UK can apply to become permanent residents, as we just discussed, it's possible that many won't do this and will end up returning to the EU. Financial services are incredibly important to the UK, with a large percentage of the UK's GDP coming from that sector. Currently, UK companies are able to work with EU clients using passporting rights. Essentially, passporting rights allow UK banks to operate in EU nations without having to set up subsidiaries in each country. The proposed deal only gives London's financial centre basic access to EU markets, known as equivalents, falling short of the access granted by passporting rights. Equivalence means that countries can only do business with the EU if the European Commission determines that the regulations and standards of the country are close enough to the EU's. This isn't ideal, considering that the rights of equivalence can be revoked with just 30 days notice. Also, there's no real legal agreement on what constitutes equivalence, so it's likely that the Commission will force the UK to accept standards it doesn't like in order to remain equivalent. This is especially worrying for sectors where equivalence isn't accepted or recognised as a concept of EU law, sectors including the commercial banking industry and primary insurance. The Financial Conduct Authority said that if the UK loses passporting rights, UK banks could lose up to £9 billion, which would have ripple effects through the economy and employment. When it comes to travel, free movement of people will end, meaning UK citizens will no longer have the right to move or work to EU countries without a visa. The same applies to EU citizens coming to the UK. Despite this, visa-free travel will allow Brits to visit the EU without the need for a visa, and vice versa. The deal doesn't make clear what will happen to UK universities after 2020. Universities in the UK currently benefit from EU research funding, but this is set to stop when the UK leaves the EU. 
The deal sets out no provisions related to this, so we don't currently know what will happen to UK university funding or to the EU students and academics currently at UK unis. No Brexit video will be complete without talking about farming or fish. The UK says that when it leaves the EU, it will become an independent coastal state. This means that the UK will be consulted on fishing opportunities and invited to comment on EU fishery policies. The new plan likely means that the UK will be allowed to choose who has access to their waters. And as such, the UK probably won't allow the EU to continue freely accessing its waters. However, some have complained that the proposed deal lacks clarity, with the Scottish fishing industry saying that the deal isn't clear enough. This should be concerning to May, as the 13 Scottish Conservative MPs have said that they vote against any bill which doesn't meet the needs of the Scottish fishing industry. For farming, the deal sets the UK up to leave the Common Agricultural Policy in March 2019. The future agricultural relationship between the UK and EU will then be arranged during the transition phase. In Parliament on Tuesday, Theresa May said that negotiations had not been a comfortable process and neither the UK or EU were totally happy with the deal. The question is if both sides are happy enough with the deal for it to pass to the EU summit and on to Parliament. To stay up to date with the latest developments in Brexit, subscribe to TLDR News. This video is brought to you by our Patreon backers. To support us and independent news, you can donate a small amount of money to TLDR monthly. There's a link to our Patreon page in the description.